recorded actually. Okay. So as I mentioned, um, no much video. I'm going to explain uh, uh, at one type of uh, neural layers, which is quite uh, appropriate for sequence processing, basically. So first, I'll acknowledge Santiago Pascual and Marta Ruiz, who have helped me in preparing this uh, model. And if you want to see how they explain it, you can check their videos. They are already online, and you have another point of view for, for this topic. So first, the motivation, as we are in this master on computer vision, I should make some motivation regarding video, and you are in the video module. So where are you going to uh, use RNNs if you're ever going to use them uh, regarding video? Um, so far, you've um, studied how images in neural networks are typically uh, processed with convolutions, with convolutional neural networks, and hope you've seen some of these architectures. You know that you can understand convolutional networks as feature extractors. So uh, you know, normally you train them for some tasks, but you may just not look at the final output, maybe just take the output some layer and use that, these features to solve other tasks. Okay? So one thing that you can think about is you, you have your video, your video frames, you feed them uh, through a convolutional network, you feed, you obtain some features, and then these features, that's what now we're going to use something with them. Okay? In particular, we're going to feed them in another type of network called recurrent neural networks, or you can think uh, that's one option. Um, then next week, you'll see exactly how we do that, and then we can solve, for example, the super uh, basic task of action recognition. So what if in the video there's some activity, maybe somebody jumping, how are you going to rec recognize that unless you take into consideration the motion, the, the changes on state, okay? So that's a, one architecture that would allow you to, to do that. And I know you don't know the top block, which is called RNN, is recording your networks, but I'm going to go through, the, through it now. Yeah? So let's go. Um, just in general, let's motivate this problem of uh, how to capture context. Uh, so context is very important for many of the decisions we, we take. And I have like, some uh, questions for you. Um, maybe can you try to recall the fifth uh, digit of your phone number? OK, or maybe okay, sing or think, think, think that you sing your favorite song uh, beginning at the third sentence. Yeah, or recall the 10 characters of your alphabet. So these are all tasks that you can probably solve them, but probably you're going to solve them after uh, running some sequence. Yeah, so somehow our brain is, is wired in some way in which information to access it, for some of them, it's, it's part of a sequence. So um, the, the sequence, or the context of the information we actually want, it's important, it's relevant, it's interesting that neural networks would have uh, some methods to capture that and to learn how to capture that. Um, also, um, just, uh, it will be also desirable, as that's what the, the final idea, that apart from having the context, that we know the order, somehow the order of the, of the sequence. So that will be also an uh, interesting uh, feature. So let's go now for a much more specific uh, problem. Just consider that you're processing a, a time series, so one, one dimensional signal, like this one, and you take what you know so far from uh, neural networks, uh, from multi-layer perceptrons, let's say, because there's, that's all we, but that's what the, the, op the obvious option that we have. I'd like you to, to address a task of uh, what could you do if you wanted to, let's say, predict the next sample. So just take, uh, try to predict the sample at t plus one, considering the previous sample uh, or the current sample t, t minus one, t minus two, blah, blah, until tau. So you, 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 we, you're, you know tau, okay, somebody tells you, okay, that's, that's tau. Um, how, how do you think that with a new network, network we could predict the next sample? How would be the, the most basic option for that from what you've seen so far? Can you imagine an architecture that will solve that? So you have tau values and you want to predict something. What could you do? The most ba basic thing, Oscar. Yes. <laughs> uh, try to fit some kind of or line or polynomial or something like that. With neural networks, let's I'm thinking about neural architectures. The e easy-ish thing, super easy. And you know, the, it's, it's always tau. Uh, Sorry. 
Recruiter network, it would be a very good solution, but we haven't explained that yet. So if you didn't know about recruiter networks, which that's what I'm assuming, otherwise that's, you're, it's going to be very boring, um, what would you do if you say, okay, just solve that with a neural network, what would you do? Yes, Lucas? No? Okay. Okay, you have, uh, I don't know, you have n values and you want to regress it to something, what su the super basic architecture. I'm going to give you some tips, I'm going to throw like some tau input neurons, okay? So you have, uh, so there are tau neurons here. And I want uh, to predict uh, x, okay, I'm not sure if you see anything at all. Turn me on. Okay, yes. You want to predict x t plus one. Okay, I'm already giving you some tips, some hints, like what could we do now? Okay. Yeah, I think you could do a convolution of stack on, on Windows. Okay. So. Yes, okay. That's something you can do. I guess that's Fine. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But that's what. That's not exactly what I had in mind, but it's it's also what I had in mind. Okay. Um, that's fine. Interpolation. Huh? Interpolation. Interpolation. But I want I want to solve it with deep neural networks. That's that's my my requirement. Is you're going to use a deep neural network? Okay. So uh, okay with a convolution that's fine because we know tau. So um, we would learn. What, what would be like the most basic thing here we can do? Okay, yes, that's what I was kind of expecting, but convolution, I mean, you can, you can somehow understand that the way we use a multiple perceptron here, it's kind of a convolution. So it's, I, I have the slides thinking about multiple perceptrons, but we can discuss how, how different that would be for uh, 1D convolutions. Because I'm not sure, have you seen 1D convolutions ever? How, okay, who of you have? seen 1D convolutions ever. Yeah, okay, you have, okay, great. So that you're familiar, okay. So you can think that it's 1D convolutions, but never mind. It's, that's, but the slides are with the multiple perceptron because they're like multiple layers, okay? So just think this is a com two convolution. Um, okay, so you would like, okay, as you see, you can think that it's, so it's a multiple perceptron, so if you have convolutions, you only have one of these, let's say and the output, you learn super good weights that give you directly the output. So you can think, or you can think there are like different layers. Probably it should work better if, if you have more, more layers, right? If you can think, uh, if you consider the 1D convolutions as, a, um, as the window of size, in this case it's uh, L or, or tau actually, um, what would you do is you just uh, shift this um, window and just predict the next, the next uh, sequence, yeah? If you do it very well, you can predict the, the future of stock market and be rich or whatever, or try to, to predict you know, the sports uh, games scores or whatever. Then, um, let's see, uh, considering the case of the, of the multiple perceptron, um, there's one design parameter here which is very important, which is the, the length. Okay, here I wrote tau, but actually there's, like, there's an L, yeah? If if you so do, do you do we know by default uh, what's what's the optimal uh, length for that window? Do we know at all? In general, no. If we assume we know nothing about the problem, because I didn't give you any information, so okay, you could say yeah, I will try with my training data set. I will try with different values, and one of them will be the best one, and I use that one. But uh, just consider something like think about the multiple perceptron, especially. Um, what's, what's the pay, what's the price to pay if you make your window larger and larger? How, what happens with the amount of parameters? It's too much, too much processing time. It, it will grow, okay, a lot. And, it's, and if you use multiple perception, that's, these are many parameters. So see if, if you make, in this setup, the window larger, it increases. Um, so that's, that's a, and, and we don't really know how big this window should be, right? And what, what we would like is to have some kind of architecture that learns how, how long back it should look at to decide what's the next uh, value. That would be ideal, that would be great. So we don't need to worry about 
how about the, about the, the size of the window or the size of the one deconvolutional filter. Yeah? So that's one motivation, one of the issues that recurrent neural networks address. And, and there are other architectures and there are other ways that kind of solve it, okay? That's, I'm not going to say that's the only way to do it. Um, other problems that this architecture, this approach would have is that as at each uh, position in time we are fitting that into the to our network, its decision, its decision is totally independent. Okay, the network has no idea of what the same network decided in the previous time step, which maybe that's not very smart, okay, because maybe uh, you want to condition the, the future decision, decisions based on, the, on your past ones. Yeah, imagine that you're going to break the t plus one and t plus two and t plus three and t plus whatever. It would be interesting to know what you predicted in the past. Um, and also, uh, just imagine that at the beginning of the sentence, oh, sorry, of the sequence, you, you have this window of L, but w when you start, you only have one, one sample, right? So uh, you, you've seen that problem already, probably when dealing with convolutions, right? And you know there's a solution called padding, which is put something there, typically zeros, but okay, that's not very neat in the end. It, it may work, but it, it has some problems because we are adding some values which are actually not part of the sequence. Yeah, so these are all the, or some of the uh, solutions, uh, problems when dealing with uh, fixed size input windows, let's say, whether a multiple perceptron, whether one deconvolution. So let's see how can we solve that. Um, so the one of the possible solutions are the recurrent neural layers. And what we are going to do, the basic idea now, is that given a, a layer, you can think this is a multilayer perceptron, uh, with its uh, activations, that's supposed to be a sigmoid, I guess, or tangent hyperbolic. And then you know that you have these weights, you have seen them already for a multilayer perceptron. And now what we are doing, we are adding a new set of weights that connect. And now this is the, the clue for today, okay? So just if, if one idea I want you to take home from today, that's the next one. So this arrow that I draw here is not one arrow of this neuron with itself only. It's this with all the rest. So th there's, so this connection in time we are doing, it's connecting with all uh, the neurons of the same layer. Yeah, and that normally that's what uh, makes you a bit co confused. So now uh, what we're going to do is we're going to learn a new set of weights, these uh, weights U you have here on top. Okay, these weights U they would add to, so, so far you, you've seen in the multilayer perceptron you have the, let's say, the weights from the feed-forward form, which will be this W. These are the, the arrows that grow from bottom to top. Uh, so you multiply in this case to, to the input, the X at time, te time step T. And now we have a new set of weights, U, that connect the hidden state at time step T with itself in the previous time step. Yeah, and the bias is the, the one that it's typically is, that it's always there. So that's the novelty, that's the recurrent neural network. That's the, the new parameters that we will need to learn. Yeah, that's, that's all. Now we can make it as much complicated as, as you want, but that's the basic idea, yeah? Um, you can understand somehow that um, the now as, as this hidden layer, um, of course, you, you could have recurrent layers in as many layers as you want it, okay? There's, I'm focusing on one, but you could have as many as you want it. Um, you can think that now uh, the hidden state or the, 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 the values, the output values of this layer, um, it can be understood as a volatile memory. So it's a kind of a memory. That now it has, it has the potential to remember what it has seen in the past, at least, which before it, it didn't. It's, it's not that obvious how it memorizes things, but there's a, there's a possibility, there's a chance now. And that's uh, really um, one of the these big ideas that you must keep in mind. So the neural networks, uh, they are the basic um, vanilla architecture that allows memorizing what you have done in, in the past, or, or one of them, in a, in, a learnable, in a learnable way. Because this, this weights you, uh, we will learn them the same way as any other parameter we, we learn in neural networks.
if we look at uh, in terms of parameters, what's the what's the price to pay? Because okay, good. Now we have uh, our layer when we add the recurrent. See, uh, it can remember. It can remember. It has the potential to remember what it has in, in the past. But there's a price to pay, and it's this price to pay is in more parameters. Yeah, these more parameters. Here I'm just doing the computation of how many parameters you would have in a in a layer. You would have the classic uh, number of parameters of uh, W, which would be the number of inputs uh, with the number of units in, the, in this neuron. So you just mu multiply them, number of uh, inputs with number of units. At this first term, you have the bias, which, which there's a bias in each unit, so number of units. And now, as there's this, again, this other uh, connection that I draw one, one arrow, but there should be many, okay? Uh, there are actually, there are and number of units per number of units, because I'm connecting each of them in, in the past with each of them in the current state. Yeah, clear? So one more idea is like when we add recurrence into a layer, that's going to be more parameters. Yeah, so at least you have a larger memory footprint and, and, some, more, and some more problems that are coming now. Um, this is a, a figure that thing that uh, kind of shows an implementation of a recurrent neural network that I found it quite useful uh, after a lot of time of teaching this course, and I found it la last a couple of years ago, I think. Um, it kind of just graphically shows what I've been explaining. Um, you would have imagine that you need to really implement it, a recurrent uh, layer. How would you do it? So you would take the input. Uh, in this case, it's a three, three, di three dimensions. And then uh, you have a recurrent neural network with two neurons in this example, yeah. And there's as it has two neurons. There's a hidden state from the from the previous time step. So if you want to uh, compute the next uh, hidden state, what you are going to do is you are going to let's say from the green um, balls that will be like the feed forward part of the network. So each, each of these lines corresponds to a parameter you need to estimate. And you can think, you can think it's like a concatenation. And that, this makes sense because later I'm going to explain more complex architecture. That's going to be very useful. Okay? Maybe you say, okay, why, why he's making things so complicated now? But I think it, now it's easy to understand this with what you've seen in the past. Yeah? You can think that what you're doing now is you are concatenating that um, these uh, weights that uh, are outputs from the green balls, they are the Ws here. These are these Ws, and the other edges uh, that uh, output from the red ones, these are the, the U. Yeah. So then you would, uh, let's say, take the input, take the previous hidden state. So this, this green part corresponds, uh, green is X. Um, the red, sorry, the red part is the previous hidden state, and then you compute the, all the cross products. The T here, uh, it corresponds, it means there's a tangent, uh, tangent hyperbolic activation. It can, be, it can be an activation, there's transparent of the kind of activation that you do with the idea of recurrency. And with that, uh, that's, a, that's a new hidden state, right? Yeah, clear? So later I'm going to make this much more complicated to, to explain other uh, architectures. If you, uh, okay, that's the, that would be like the animations, right? So you start with the input, the hidden units. You can think if you want to implement it, you can concatenate them and you uh, do all the products and, and sums. Good. Now let's go for the, what, what in some cases that confuses you a lot as well, which is that as recurring on uh, networks normally, or they are, their main purpose is to uh, process sequences of data points. Normally, we don't have this, let's say, frontal view of neurons that we are used to when looking at multilayer perceptrons. Yeah. So so far, you've seen multilayer perceptrons mostly like this. Yeah, from frontal view, which this would be like UPC's logo. Yeah. So. But normally, when you when you read papers on recurrent neural networks, you don't you don't look at the networks in this way. But you have a rotation. You you look, you look at the neurons side sideways. So that's that's what you normally see. 
And what you see this, so this would be like, if you have the UPC logo from the side, you would only see like these three balls. But, but there are, so in, behind each of these blue balls, there are two more, yeah? And always remember that, always when, when you start seeing graphs on uh, recurring neural networks, like this one, on RNNs like this, remember that behind each of these uh, neurons, there are many more, yeah? So I do this rotation, uh, normally you call that this, that's the unfold, so here time would be against the screen, here time goes from left to right. So uh, let's say this would be like the input at uh, t, t plus one, t plus two, yeah? And this weight, you see, w2, so that's w2, that's always the same weight. That would be the, the weight, that would be the u from the previous uh, equations. That's the, the, the one that's connecting the, the neurons of the hidden state with themselves. Yeah? Are you ready for this? Because now most of the visualizations will be uh, with the arrow of time from left to right. Okay, so now uh, here you have the frontal view unfold. So now here from left to right you have the chime. And that gives you, this should give you now the idea, and that's the other important idea, when, especially when doing training, uh, that now we have another type of depth. So, so far, you've uh, studied deep neural networks in terms of, okay, I have my layer of neurons and I stack another layer on top, another on top, another on top. So the way they are more and more and they are deep and at the end, at the end of all these layers, there's some output which is useful for us. Yeah? And you did back propagation through on this dimension, on the, the depth-wise dimension. But now, as we have time, we have kind of another dimension in which information flows. And in a few slides, you'll see that when we do the training, now we have another dimension in which gradients propagate, which makes things quite uh, more complicated. Yeah, so now uh, you have this extra temporal depth. So in this figure, so that will be like front, classic frontal, unfold from left to right if it's time. So from bottom to top, that will be like the classic depth you know about. From left to right, it's the temporal depth, the new one that we have. Yeah, so, and, and everything that you know about propagation applies here. You will also need to pro propagate gradients through this new dimension. Okay, I think we've commented this. So, what happens when we do the training of back propagation? through time, in, in addition to the propagation through depth, yeah? So they, they are, we are doing both. Well, um, so imagine that we have our sequence, x, x1, x, x0, x1, x2, x3. Imagine that at each time step, we have some labels that allow us to compute an error. So it's, it's a super, super simple neural network with only one hidden layer, okay? So now one hidden layer, the output, and we have um, some ground truth, we can compute an error, but now we compute an error at time step zero, time step one, time step two, time step three. At each time step we have an error signal. So first of all, um, whatever amount of time steps we consider, the total error that's going to uh, guide our um, gradient computation, let's say, uh, that's, that's the sum. It's going to be like the sum of all the errors. So when you compute the gradient, we'll need to compute the gradient with respect to all the errors. Uh, in addition to the gradient, classic gradient from depth. Yeah? Then, if you are following all this uh, argumentation, you would say, okay, um, if, let's say, if, if I consider my sequence extremely long, this is going to be very complicated to implement in a machine with finite memory. Because uh, you need to remember everything you've done, all the gradients, properly everything. If you've tried to train your network, I hope you have, you, you see that it's, it's already complicated with the, with the few layers you have probably put. So what if you have like, I don't know, hundreds, thousands, millions of, time steps to back propagate because each time it's like one more layer, right? So imagine like a sequence of, I don't know, 100 uh, time steps. 
it will be like 100 layers, uh, which is tricky to, to train a, neuro, a, neuro, uh, a net with 100 layers. So in practice, and now that's the <laughs> what you will not like, but that's how things work. Uh, when you, in practice, what you do at training time, you truncate the, the, the length of the sequence. So you'll see always that there's a parameter at training time that would say, okay, uh, I know that this should be infinite, infinite, but it's not going to be infinite. Just consider this whatever amount of time steps in time. So in, in, in Keras, for example, um, there's a parameter. Uh, if you try, if you look at the documentation called SQL length, I'm not sure if any of you know what happens in Python. So I didn't look for it, but each each uh, framework, when you use uh, recurrent uh, layers, recurrent layers, um, there's a, a way to to indicate how many time steps it should consider to compute the gradients. Yeah, and you will need to set that and and, and keep that in co into account. Like, okay, in theory, it should be able to remember everything, and at inference, there's no problem, but at training time. I mean, that in French, it just forgets about what it saw in, in the past, and that's it. But at training time, when computing gradients, we, we take a, a small window there. Yeah? And, and, and it's going to be a parameter you need to set yourself. And the larger, the more memory it will take. And as you probably will not have much memory, it will not be very large in general. OK, problems from vanilla recurrent neural networks. Um, it is true that uh, these architectures, they have the potential to, to remember the hidden steps in, let's say, in, uh, just, let's forget about the implementation now, okay? Let's imagine that we have infinite memory in our GPU, but so they have the potential to remember all the previous hidden states. That's it. So they have the potential to remember everything they have seen in the past, because the hidden state, states, they they are related to the input signal that has, this, that has been fed into the network. Yeah, so they have the potential to remember everything. But, there's uh, some buts here. It has the potential, but remember that this, um, all our hidden states in the end, uh, they will go through the um, activation functions of our, of our neurons, one, which might uh, distort, There's, there might be some nonlinearities there, probably at some point you will be there, and some nonlinearity is going to distort, uh, damage the, the hidden state, it will not just keep it uh, totally fresh or, or um, unmodified. And in addition, that's going to be multiplied by the parameters of, the, of U, of the matrix that it's, that it's uh, modeling the, the connections in time. So, Yes, it has the potential to remember everything, but um, it is, this is going through nonlinearities and multiplication for you. So, actually, actually, in practice, it, it tends to the long-term memory it tends to vanish and disappear after many time steps. So that's one uh, problem: long-term memory. And another problem is um, that uh, as you are you are um, you have this extra dimensional on, on time, and you're providing gradients. So the same problems that you may have when you have like uh, just feed-forward networks, sometimes gradients disappear, uh, they, they vanish, or sometimes they explode. Uh, that, that's even more prone to happen when you have this extra dimension, especially if you, if you take a long temporal dimensions. So in practice, if you try to train what I just explained, it will rarely work. <laughs> going to be super unstable and it's going to be quite uh, challenging to train. Okay, so it's a very nice story, but in practice, nobody uses that. But, but the concept is, 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 the, is, is interesting. Yeah? And, and I'm going to tell you how, how in practice you address that, but, but, but you'll see that these are like tricks to, to solve these two problems. Yeah? Okay, so how to solve that? Um, there are, basically there's one, two architectures that are very popular, so, which are, let's say, uh, practical implementations of this concept of recurrent layers that I presented. So the most popular one, uh, it's called long short-term memory. 
and it's been there since 1997, so quite a long time, more than 20 years, actually. Uh, yeah. Uh, so one of so it was uh, proposed by Sepp Hochreiter and Jürgen Smith Huber. Jürgen Smith Huber is one of these uh, scientists that has contributed a lot on deep learning. And there's if you follow Twitter or you are up to these discussions, you see that it's very controversial. That he claims that some of of, of the contributions from other authors authors they actually uh, also proposed them that they didn't cite him. And there's don't know, there's some uh, discussions there. I invite you to to know everything. So you can if you can click if you click here on the on the orange box, uh, you you see most of his claims. But basically, uh, he, he he argues that while most of the fame now it's for Geoffrey, Geoffrey Hinton, Joshua Benjo, and Yannick Kuhn, that he he and his team also had interesting uh, contributions. I think that I think that nobody <laughs> argues that he he was uh, one of the main contributors to LSTMs, which is these long short term memories that I'm working on. Uh, sorry, so I'm presenting, and actually uh, there was a, this conference, uh, NIPS. Now, now it's called NIRIPS, but in 2016 it was held in Barcelona, and that day he gave uh, this talk with a crowded room, people in line, and I, 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 I managed to get in, but we had to be in line for a long time. In a conference, that's very weird, okay? You don't go to a conference and you are in a line to get into a talk, of, okay? So it was kind of a lot of hype. Uh, security guards at the door because people wanted to enter when the when there was were there no more seats so there was a lot of uh, expectation because again he's quite he's a good researcher he's a very good researcher and and also controversial and that year he was kind of he was saying okay I'm here uh, 2016 I'm celebrating the 20 years of the long term memory okay and now now finally somebody's paying attention of what we proposed at, at that time which is kind of a similar um, I shouldn't say claim, but, but that, that has happened for many uh, scientists who for a long time were working on deep neural networks, on neural networks, that the community vision didn't pay attention to that. Yalekun was rejected one after time after time from CPR, right? And I remember, so, also remember when he came to give a keynote, he said, okay, yeah, good. Now. So after all these years, now you invite me for a keynote. That was kind of the first thing that, that he said, that he was kind of also one of, of from his perspective on that, and, and I guess that he was happy to, to see that now um, his uh, PhD team at that time and, and himself, they proposed LSTMs, and now this tool is used by uh, old industry basically to process uh, sequences, or in, in many cases, okay, because now there are other options, okay, but at least at, in 2016, uh, most people were, we were using LSTMs. Now there are also many interesting works with, you know, uh, with just attention or convolutions. But let's focus on LSTMs and explain what it's like. Okay, so now maybe you understand why I was uh, spending so much time earlier uh, presenting this graph on RNN. So now you have the, that same graph, but now explain for LSTMs. Um, so I have a few slides, so if, if you don't follow, if you can, don't understand this one, I'll, I'll go for, for uh, I have other graphical representations. So again, now, again, same thing. We have the input and we have the hidden state in the previous time step. There's, that's the same. Yeah? Same sizes. So we start with concatenate. And now, instead of having just one multi layer perceptron, we have one, two, three, and four, which is uh, new, right? Um, what would be like the, the one that we saw earlier? It's this one, the one that has a T. As I told you, that's the tangent hyperbolic that we like, the normal one. But um, there are like one, two, three more um, that they are called the forget gate, input gates. In this graph, they consider both of these input gates because they, they, I guess they, they kind of get connected. Uh, they, they affect how the input uh, goes through this. Uh, okay. Anyway, three gates, forget gate, input gate, and output gate. Yeah? And that's why there's the, let's say, the, the regular uh, recurrent layer will be this one, and three gates. So LSTM, it's regular one and three gates. So what do these gates do? So these gates, they kind of control how uh, memory, that in this work, it's called cell state. That's what you have here on top. This, this cell state was not in the vanilla RNN, in the previous one, yeah? And you can think that this, you can just think that it's kind of a memory, this volatile memory, but now it's more, it's more protected. It's not just, it's not just the, the value of the, of the hidden uh, layer. Okay, it's something else. At what we do with memories? So we can uh, delete 
contents from memory. And that's what, what this gate does. So this gate, it's telling you, like, based on the hidden state on previous state and, and the current input, I can decide to modify the cell state with a multiplication to delete. It's called forget gate. So forget some, some stuff from the past. That's its role. This other gate, uh, you, can, you can distinguish the gates because there's an S, which, is, which stands for sigmoid activation. And I think that's why we have here we have the T just to make it different from the S, but it could be, it could be any activation, okay? So we have the S, um, so another input gate that will tell you, okay? So um, the output of the, let's say, the, the response of, of, to the current input of the, of the basic recurrency, how much it should enter into the memory. So that's the input gate. So this gate is, again, here it's multiplying, the gates multiply. So the input gate is multiplying, let's say, the output of the, of the current, uh, of the proper recurrent layer from the, the one that you saw earlier. So it, it multiplies, so it tells you okay, uh, how much we're going to, to put in the cell state, and then so you add the, the result it's added here. And after that, the cell state just goes to the next, uh, to the next time step. There's, there's no change, there are no more changes in the memory, so you say, you decide how much you want to remove and how much you want to add, based on the current input. And there's still this part that what it, got, what it does is, there's another, still another um, um, nonlinearity. And it's, this one is governed by the output gate. So the output gate, it's telling you how much of the cell state, um, oh, so yeah, it will tell you how to compute the next uh, hidden state based on the contents of the cell state. So it just propagates uh, the hidden state for the next um, time step. Yeah, and this, that's, that's called the output gate. So now, uh, instead of having, uh, let's say, the extra parameters of the recurrency, which in the end they were the, the ones that were connected in this case to, the, to these red balls, these red neurons. No, not only we have these parameters, but we have all, also all the parameters for all the gates. So that's much more parameters than, than, the, than the classic feedforward network. Yeah? So that's the LSTM. So an LSTM in the end it's like uh, a recurrent network with three gates, and each gate they are kind of printing values that govern how to erase, write, yeah, erase and write a cell state, which is, can be understood as a, as a memory. Yep? I do not understand why the, how the output gate determines the, 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 the hidden state before taking information from the cell state, so the multiplication. Sorry, uh, it's, uh, it's from the hidden state and the input, sorry, uh, maybe I, should, I didn't mention that. So from the cell state, yes, but also from the input. That's, that's how the architecture is it's implemented. So this, this actually this hidden state, uh, no, actually it's used everywhere, right? So it's used everywhere, yeah. Is there any threshold? No, that's, everything is differentiable completely. That's, that's a, a nice part. And here you have the animation in case you don't follow, but first you compute the forget gate, uh, input gates, you update the cell state, and now with the output gate you decide how much um, it goes to the next time step. Then same story but with other figures that I used to have, and actually many people uh, use them, from uh, Christopher Ola, which is a, a very good He's a very good scientist and also very good, um, very good at communicating, at explaining concepts. He has so many super nice blogs and visualizations to explain all these deep neural, neural concepts. So at that time, he had this uh, alternative um, representation, which you have the, the input, you have the hidden state from here. You can see here the three uh, sigmoids for the gates, the tangent uh, hyperbolic, I think there's a tangent hyperbolic uh, inverse, I think, and the forget gate. And these are the uh, sigmoids, you know what the sigmoid is. 
and that at each uh, gate, what you do, you are concatenating the input with the key and state and time, time step. But you've seen that. I think that if you've seen the, the graphs earlier, now it's easier to understand the, the formulas. That will be the formula for the forget gate, with a formula for the input gate, uh, in contribution to the stealth state, which will be like the classic neuron. And that's how, how the cell state is um, updated. The output gate and the output gate, yeah, and how, how the, the next hidden state is, is computed. And as we, it's going to be on different time steps, so we're going, that's going to be, let's say, repeated. You can think it's repeated uh, across time in the time temporal di uh, dimension. Yeah. Then, as I already mentioned uh, briefly, uh, now we we have um, not only so the the amount of parameters now it's increased not only with uh, the product of the number of units. Uh, sorry, here the product with the number of units and and but now we have like everything number inputs number of units and the bias. Uh, so this will be like the feedforward uh, network, the um, recurrency and the bias per four, because we have these four, uh, well, the three gates and the, and the recurrent layer. Then there is an alternative uh, layer called uh, gated recurrent unit, which is quite similar in spirit, but it has one gate less. And if you wonder if that's better or worse, maybe it gets a bit better, but it's, there's nothing huge. So I guess the best thing you can do is try with both for your problem. Okay, it's not conclusive. You, you can find works using both or, or the other, and I guess that they, they tested with both. And here you have the, the graph, but I think it's, it's enough. Okay, oh, okay, that slide was... Just to finish, um, I know that that this computer vision course, but I think it's good, especially the way things go, that you have some ideas of what's beyond vision. And this this topic is quite good for for doing that because actually recurrent, recurrent uh, neural networks did not become popular from vision at all, right? Um, I think that um, nowadays if you open your mind to other modalities, which I suggest that you do. Um, at least there are uh, problems like language, like speech, like audio, that are being treated with almost or, or, or the, almost the same tools, or same tools that we are using in vision. Uh, this mean, which is pretty cool, because for the first time, uh, we are, these communities we are speaking a lot between us, and that allows us to make super cool uh, projects. So one way that I, I invite you to think about, and you see this slide, I think, uh, in a, a few more lectures, is that now what the, 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 the way to understand neural networks is that we, we have encoders that learn some representations, and these representations, they can be decoded in another uh, type of media, right? I know that so far you've basically, you've uh, just look at vision, but you can do the same thing, thing with uh, other modalities. And I'll give you like some, some examples based on recurrent neural networks. So actually, uh, recurrent neural networks uh, became very popular thanks to their success in uh, this application, neural machine translation. Okay? Um, how does this work? So neural machine translation, it's this task in which you go from one language to another. Yeah? In the most basic setup, you have a, a very large corpus, a very large data set, uh, parallel, in which you have uh, sentences in one language, Short language and then the corresponding sentence in the target language. That's very, very large, uh, large enough to train a neural network. In language, uh, in the end, these are sequences of words. And as these are sequences, that these are very uh, well suited to be exploited with RNNs. Let's see how we can uh, solve neural machine translation with this tool. So actually, what, what you do, imagine that you have this sentence, economic growth has slowed down in recent years, and what we want to compute, okay, it's a representation. Okay, now I'm, I'm just looking at the encoder. So what could I do? 
I could first um, take all the words that say in English, yeah, and I, that's, or many, or the most frequent ones, yeah, let's say that the 5,000 words in English, yeah, and I have a, I take a vector of 5,000 positions and I assign one position for each word, yeah, that's called one hot encoding, which in the end, I don't know if you ever thought about that, that's what uh, any image net classifier is doing, or right? So it's just it's encoding it's encoding your image into into a one hot vector that you call it classification. But okay, you can also think that we are encoding it into one, a one hot vector. And just do the opposite. You take a, a word, you have the one hot uh, encoding vector, and then typically typically what you do is uh, you feed it into some network that was trained in an unsupervised way. And which give, uh, and which, as a result of this magic training, that uh, it's, it's trained, for example, with you take Wikipedia and you train, uh, train a, uh, a multiple perceptron to predict the next word. Uh, so, give, given a, uh, given a, yeah, given a word, let's say, and it's not exactly like this, but let's say, given the, the last three words, uh, predict the fourth, for example. So, you, you put some context and you ask the network to predict the, the missing word. Yeah, and there are many tasks. Okay, that's called language modeling. It's a whole discipline by itself. But the point is that there are neural networks that allow you to go from this 5k um, vector to something much more smaller, smaller dimension. Okay, so the, that would that here it's noted as continuous space word representation. So that would be this vector. Okay, and this vector is now finally what we can fit into a recurrent neural network. LSTM, GRU, or whatever. Okay? Here we make it easy, we just put one ball, vanilla RNN. But in practice, you'll need to put an LSTM. Yeah? So what can we do? We can have our uh, RNN. Remember that behind this neuron, there are as many as we decide, because uh, again, it's a neural network. You decide how many neurons you want. And we just fit each, each word. So each, uh, in, that's, these are called word embeddings, actually, normally. So you fit all of them for all the sentence, and at the end, you look at at the state of the of this hidden uh, layer it, that has an output that 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 has the potential to take into account all the previous outputs. Okay, so it, it has problems, but that's the the idea. Yeah. So you have a vector that has the potential the potential to represent the whole sentence. So we have what what we want here, which is a representation. So we have a sentence, and we have one vector that represents that sentence. So what can we do now? So we can take the representation and say and, and train an onion network that's going to decode. So given the representation, decode or decode. Uh, so give the representation, encode it from English to the representation. Now maybe you can decode. You want to decode it to French. And now, so you fit the representation into an onion network. That is going to uh, predict the word, the first word of the sentence in French. Then this prediction will be okay. This prediction is here because it is like soft prediction. You take the maximum, you feed the maximum into the next state. You have the hidden state that it's updated with the with the with the weights that that we learn, and we predict the next word. So here, first word is la, uh, second word croissants, uh, third word economic. Yeah, and we just keep predicting words. Normally, oh, normally, always there is a, spe a special word that's called uh, okay, could be called end of sentence. And say okay, that's it's over. Sentence is over. Yeah, and this and that's that's this is the the most basic solution for neural mach uh, neural machine translation. So we go from one text from one language to another. Yeah, following this idea of encoding decoding. Um, what else can we do? We can uh, encode speech, right? Speech are also time series, and nothing prevents us to, uh, well, there's, there's the potential to encode sequences of, of speech. Okay, I, I just make these comments because it's not as easy as, it, as I'm telling it, okay? It's a, it's a nightmare to do that, but okay, the concept is, I just want to tell you that with, with RNNs we can do encode many multimedia signals, and it has been done. Uh, so there are work with speech. Uh, there are also words that so that encode speech. 
words that decode speech, so they generate speech. Okay, it's, there's something wrong. And if we can encode and decode the speech and encode and decode text, uh, we can solve one of these basic tasks, which is called from speech to text. That's automatic speech uh, recognition. Yeah, we can take the speech, and they have their own representations. If you feed that into a, an RNN, and the RNN will uh, predict sequences of words. So we have the transcriptions of, of the spoken words. And that will be it in terms of RNNs and slightly, very slightly, some of their applications. Um, homework for you, because you don't have project until Thursday. You have project on the other module. You have project on the other module, okay. But in your spare time, you can look at all this material, right? So, uh, so I especially suggest you watch Santi's lecture. Actually, maybe you want to watch the first. So this is the second part, which he goes beyond. Uh, that's more introductory. You have many lectures and, and things to read about. E I also encourage you to, to so, so there's this lab. You don't, need, you don't need to submit to us at all, okay? But there's this lab that we uh, made for the course here at, at UPC um, and Telecommunication School. And there's a lab for RNNs in PyTorch that uh, Santiago Pascual, Pascual developed, which is very informative. And I encourage you to, to go through it. Actually, th there are many lot from him. So if you click here, you see all our slides and videos for deep learning. In case there's something that maybe is not clear enough from what you've seen in, in this master, sometimes it helps to see, to see it from another perspective. Yeah? And I think that would be it for RNNs. Is there, you, is there any question? Yep. But normally, you'd, so normally, what, what you, okay, I think, so in our, on our or, or anywhere, so that's something that you just learn or you train. So when, when you train, you, you create one more, in the, this one hot encoding, you create one more that is called end of sentence or that's it. And when you train, so you fit the, you fit the words of your, um, of your sentences, and at the end, you add this, this word that you invented to sign out that it's over. Um, if you do that, the decoder, when it, it, it decides that it's over, it, it will output this, this value. Okay. Yeah? But it's just, it's one, one more position in this one hot encoding. Um, well, yeah, that's one way, yeah. <laughs> let's see. More questions? No? Okay, so see you on Thursday for the project then. <laughs>